Well, good morning and welcome to Tea Time. That's right, we are back and we have three good, strong TEAs coming to you this afternoon, this morning, and this evening. And don't forget, this evening's Tea Time will be at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Center Time instead of 7 p.m. because Bob is back to work. As we know, the strike is over with some of the actors in that. So we'll get into Bob's Tea Time a little later this evening, but this morning, I have the incredible John Callis joining me. He's a veteran Hollywood writer, director, producer, author, and filmmaker, and he is a man who speaks truth. So this morning, this tea time will be triggering, so I want everyone to understand that if it is too much, I will not be um, offended if it's too much and you have to come for a different tea time. So let's get the disclaimer out there. Let me give you a little bit on John. And then if you want to know the full amount of John, you can check out his website. That'll be posted during the live tea time. Go and check out Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Give that a quick subscribe and share this tea time because today's tea time will be making a difference. We'll be sharing and saving a life. So until we get started, here's the disclaimer for Miss Liz's tea time live shows. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussion for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you, I respect your wishes and will see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea time shows this year in 2023 are done on Thursday. 10 a.m., 3 p.m., and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If it's a different time, check out the Facebook page. The notices will be there. If it's not a Thursday, it's a rescheduled tea time on a Monday or Tuesday or a surprise guest that is coming back from a season one, two, or three. So until now, we're going to get John in here, and I'm going to get him to share a different type of tea this morning. So for all of you viewers and listeners out there, I really encourage you to join this tea time with your questions and send them in. Uh, if you don't want to see your name, you can send them directly to Miss Liz's Facebook page, and I will get those questions out to John this morning. So a little bit on John, and then I'm going to get him in here, and I'm going to sip on my coffee this morning because it's morning, and then I'll have my tea this afternoon. 
John Callis is a veteran writer, director, producer in the entertainment business. His experience ranges from the worldwide releases of feature films to numerous motion picture trailers, national and international commercials, live action titles, sequ sequences, a documentary shot on location in Russia, as well as having been the worldwide VP for the Walt Disney Company while working at a large post-production facility. John wrote and directed the feature film No Solicitors, starring Eric Roberts, and has adapted New York Times bestselling book, Lightning Strikes Twice. John is a published author of Secrets, When the Rain Stops, Christmas Voices, The Myth, No Solicitors, and The First Time Parent Survival Guide of Unnecessary and Wild Spending. And John Provis, Provis can be seen on live action teasers for Ranson, Dennis the Menace, Body of Evidence, The Golden Child, Spaceballs, The Glass Ma Managers, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, Cocoon 2, Poltergeist 3, Betrayal, My Girl, Glendary, Glenn Ro Ross, title sequences for The Two Jakes and A Few Good Men, and a promotional film for an amusement ride for show, show, shows can. John also directed an award-winning short film, The right, the White Gorilla. John worked with notable actors, including Mel Gibson, Walter Mat Matthew, Jack Nicholson, Madonna, Eddie Murphy, Howie Mandel, and Mel Brooks. For John's full bio, I recommend that you go and check Miss Liz's Facebook page out. The full bio is in there. And I want to get John in here, and I want to take a sip of my coffee. So let me get John in here. Good morning, John. Good morning, Miss Liz. Oh, did I lose you? Where's your voice? Good morning. Oh, good morning. There you are. I was just like, oh, he popped out of my ears already. I, did, I didn't even get him in yet. <laughs> He's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> and that's the end of the podcast. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Come again, right? Uh, so good morning, John. Uh, I want to start off how I started off all my podcasts. So who are you as a little boy and who are you now as a grown man? Who I was as a little boy and who I was as a grown man, it swirls apart. Um, my dad died when I was three and I went into a fit of feeling very abandoned, uh, slipped into depression, gave up my religion, gave up hope, thought the world hated me and I certainly hated it. And I just didn't, didn't care anymore. And I started getting into a lot of trouble. So by the time I was 12 years old, my mother and then my stepdad at the time were given a choice by the courts, whether they would send me to military school or the court was going to send me to reform school. So after a few years in military school, um, at the age of 15, my head was just bursting. I felt completely alone, depressed, and I attempted suicide by jumping into a lake. And it was at that moment I realized there has to be something more to life than this. I, I, re I read that in your book, The Suicide Attempt uh, and that. But John, I want to take you back until you were the age of 12, the train ride. I want to get into the train ride. And for anybody who he doesn't know what uh, book I'm talking about, it's the When the Rain Stops. Check it out, John Callis's there, go to his website. It's on the screen. But John, I want to get into the the, the train ride at the age of twelve. Um, so take me back to then. All right. So at twelve years old, my mother put me in a car in New Jersey, drove to New York City, <clears throat> and put me on a train that was going to go from New York City to Virginia alone at twelve years old. And I'm at the time, you could open the windows, and I was looking out, and my mother turned away from me and started walking away. As the train pulled out, she kept getting smaller and smaller. And at that point, I realized I had been abandoned, or I thought I had been abandoned. That's the whole thing. And I thought, she's turned her back on me. She doesn't love me, that she's getting rid of me. And sure enough, within inside the hour, I got into a fight with one of the cadets, and you know, blood was flying, fists were flying, and uh, it was not a good start. And then I convinced somebody to buy me beer, <clears throat> in which I kept drinking one after another. And it just didn't get any better. <clears throat> it was a, a very dark moment in my life because I just felt like the world and the, the walls had collapsed on me and there was no getting out. 
So, John, I want to I want to get into that fist fight because in the book you get you get really like offended when the guy comes up and asks you about the MST. I think it was correct. Let me say yeah. Well, I didn't know what MST was, and having watched war movies, I thought that you know, like if you're around military guys, you can't show any weakness, so you have to be like a tough guy. So he said, "Well, what do you know about MST?" I said, "I don't even know what it stands for." He goes, "Military." Uh, science training. <clears throat> and I said, well, you don't have to be a skinhead to kick ass. And he looked at me and he said, are you calling me what I think you're calling me? I said, no, you don't look that good. And that's when the fight started. And it didn't end there, you know, and then all the cadets were pointing at me saying, oh, this kid's going to be some piece of work and good, good thing he's not in our squad or he wouldn't last. I, I really liked how you got into the book because when I, when I was reading the book, I could feel that I was on that train ride. That I was kind of like watching, you know, and maybe it's because of, of your field and what you do for a living that you were able to get that much detail in, that you could take people into the book. And it's almost like you're sitting in the car and you're watching the fight and you're watching the expression. I could see your face, like, you know, like this macho man saying, like, what do you think? Like, like you know, and yeah. like, even as you said it just now, John, like, you know, like, uh, you're not that good, you know, you know, I, I could see that attitude coming out like that straightforward and uh what what did i say the no filter uh so i want to get into the no filter as the age of 12 getting into adulthood has that no filter opened a lot of doors for you well it, it's a double-edged sword um because i had no filters and I'll be honest with you miss liz i grew up with a mouth on me i mean when your mother is trying to go to work and put food on the table and comes home and you say, mom, why aren't you eating? And she said, oh, I ate at work. And later on in life, you find out that we didn't have enough money and she was starving. Uh, she, you know, we had three kids. She was pregnant with a fourth who she miscarried at the funeral. So in, in the streets of Jersey City, you either had a mouth and, and had no filter or you were going to get slaughtered. You showed any weakness whatsoever and you were a goner. So I learned very quickly to have a mouth and, and you develop a very sharp, sarcastic wit, which doesn't really serve you too well in life. But when you grow older, you can take what seems like a, a, um, a negative kind of personality trait and reshape it so that you're not such a wise ass about things, but you're fast, you're smart, and you can um, you can begin to even though you're not filtered, you can begin to filter how you're going to say it as opposed to what you're going to say with an attitude. Same thing can come across. And I feel if you're unfiltered and honest, then nobody can come and hurt you with words or anything else because you know the truth and you've spoken it. Now, if they want to try and use that against you, you walk away because there's billions of people on the planet. You can always find friends. I like that. And I was trying to find another word for that, the, you know, the no filter. And you just said a wise ass, you know, uh, I, my, my dad used to say that all the time to me. What do you think you're a little wise ass there? Like, <laughs> so I want to go back, John, to you, you you lost your dad at the age of three. Uh, and in the book, you talk about your stepfather. So I want to talk about a little bit about your real dad. And then I want to talk about your stepfather. Um, how did you uh, come to your mom at the age of three about your dad? Well, she sat us down and had to tell us that he had passed away. And at that point, I started screaming all sorts of profanities towards God and how I hated him. How could he take my hero away, basically, you know? And uh, it led to many years later of me lying about going to baseball games with my dad because the other kids were all actively working with their fathers and I had nobody. So I started making up stories that he was still in the military and on missions and all sorts of things that were obviously not true. It was very difficult to deal with, I have to say. So when did the stepfather come into picture? Uh, I came in when I was around 12 years old. Um, so we were pretty much on our own, but uh, my mom had applied for a job at this company uh, as a bookkeeper and she knew nothing about bookkeeping. And he gave her the job and uh, she went to the library and studied all weekend. And she found some elementary mistakes and they were able to infuse the company a little bit to uh, get the company continue to run. And one thing led to another and they started dating and uh, uh, 
you know, I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for him coming into my life. I know in, in the beginning of the book, you had a lot of resentment. You had a lot of anger towards your stepfather. Uh, you, bl you blamed your stepfather as well in the book uh, for sending you off. You thought that that was one of the reasons as well that your mom was sending you away. Uh, do you want to get into a little bit of how that changed over time? Sure. Uh, I think it's important, like you said, to start the, you know, 12, I thought, again, a misconception that he was part of the reason I was being sent away so that my mother and he could be girlfriend and boyfriend together without me in the house. It never dawned on me. My sister and brother were still there. So that wasn't really the truth. But as a kid who had been abandoned already, now you see this guy coming in who's wanting to send you away yet another abandoned uh, male uh, figure in your life. And as time went on, I, you know, he eventually called three of us together and said, I'd like to uh, adopt you all. And we all looked at each other and said, really? I mean, we're all adults. He goes, I know, but I feel like I'm part of the family and I, I want to adopt you. How do you feel about that? And we all said, daddy, you know, we were joking around with him. And um, yeah, and slowly but surely, I started warming up to this guy because he would say things that would make me go, what? what? You know, and then I would throw questions at him about things that I had just finished reading. And this guy was so bright. He had a, a, an astute way of being able to talk to you in depth about things um, that he not, didn't necessarily uh, study, but he had a grasp of what the world was about, about how life was functioning. And so I started calling him and say, hey, what do you think about this? And he actually gave me the key to starting my career because I was struggling like heck. Uh, and he gave me an idea and I thought, hmm, let me run with that and see what happens. And, and it helped a lot. So he was then becoming my go to guy to talk about business or strategy or things and so on and so forth. And uh, I was the only one in the family that he pulled aside and told me um, about his blood tests and everything and that he was dying of cancer. He says, yeah. you're the only one that can handle this. So I want you to know. And I thought, wow. I've come a long way from a guy I hated to a guy who trusts only me and the family with that kind of a deep secret. Well, the reason that I wanted to talk about that, uh, John, with you is because, you know, sometimes we have this perception of somebody coming into our lives, right? And they're the ones that are taking us out of the picture, but they're actually the ones putting us in the picture. And you're just sharing that now that, you know, he turned to you out of all, all the people that, you know, that can yeah. handle it. Uh, I, I believe your stepfather passed away, correct? Yeah, he did. So how has that changed your life, John? Well, he told me one day, he said, that the, the joy and fear of having parents is that there's always a layer between you and the Grim Reaper. Once your parents are gone, you're up, you're next. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of a morbid thought, but okay, I get it. And when he passed away, I had that gut feeling again of being abandoned. And I had to literally sit myself down and say, Pop did not abandon you. It was his time to go. Let's think of all the good stuff. And then I went into a complete depression because I got scared. I thought, there goes my net. Anytime I needed any guidance or anything, I could call him. Now I'm on my own. What do I do? Who do I turn to? Again, I'm alone. And it, it kind of made me stop and say, Okay, let's let's take a breath here. You might be alone, but he taught you a lot, you know, and now it's your turn to prove to yourself you can get through this with your own guidance. Now, you, you might have to find a therapist or somebody else or a friend to talk to about certain things, but that's okay. Don't be scared to talk and reach out to people because if you do get scared and stop talking, you're going to go right into the rabbit hole. And that's what kind of transformed my life a lot. Yeah. And once you find that and fall into that rabbit hole, it's hard to get out of that rabbit hole. Yeah. There's, um, I, I tell people this all the time, unless you've experienced depression, people think like it, it's cowering into the corner and stuff, but in a very odd way, Miss Liz, sometimes depression is a safe haven because you know it, you understand it. And when you withdraw, nobody can hurt you. And so it's a safe haven that is very difficult to step out of and get into out of your comfort zone and start becoming part of the world because you built this wall around you it, that's very safe, like an animal hiding in shelter from being a, a, a you know somebody's prey. So you um, you have to find a way to start 
chiseling your way out of that. And that is not an easy place to come out of. You know, and that's the first time I hear safe haven for depression. And I, I really like that you you said that, John, because a lot of people look at depression as you being sad and depressed. Some people that have depression work harder. They become perfectionists. They, you know, they, they just get into things really deep and heavy, uh, you know, addiction sometimes. Uh, I know in the book that you share a little bit about that as well, uh, you know, that you thought that that would ease the pain, but then you found out that that doesn't help either. So uh, I want to get into that a little bit, like the addictions, John, that you fell into. Well, the addiction, that that's a tough one because I think when you're starting to look for something to ease the pain, you'll try anything. Um, and I started experimenting around with it and uh, it was taking me further away from what I felt I needed to be doing. And eventually I thought, hmm, maybe this isn't the right path gone down. And I was one of the few fortunate ones that was able to get out of that before it became uh, so habitual that I wound up in the, in the grave. And that, and that's what I liked about your book is that you were really transparent and you were really like, I tried it, but it wasn't my cup of tea. And you know what? I need to get out of this, you know, and, and thank goodness that you were able to pull yourself because not everybody is fortunate and can pull themselves out of that. Right. Correct. Uh, so again, I really recommend everybody go and grab your copy of When the Rain Stops because it is a really transparent book. It's straightforward. It's, you know, there's a lot of uh, no filter. Uh, and I like that in the book. I like that you that you cursed and that you expressed yourself in anger and, you know, because we need to be able to share that, you know, if we just sugarcoat everything. What are we actually doing? Right. We're just like putting a little sprinkle on it and then we have to deal with it even more after. So. Um, so, John, I want to get into the abuse. Uh, we got into a little bit of growing up uh, and that now let's get into the abuse. OK. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to start in military school. Now, okay. be before I get into it, I, I do want to just tell your audience this, that um, I had a horrible three years at that school. Uh, I was abused very badly, but there were kids that went to that school that absolutely loved it because they wanted to make military careers out of it. So just because my experience was horrific doesn't mean that every kid in that school had the same experience. So I think there was a difference between wanting to go to something or having to go to something. So because I had to go, I already went with a really bad attitude. My first night at the academy, and, and granted, uh, to be transparent, I had a mouth on me. Um, I got knocked out three times by the senior uh, cadets because I had such a mouth on me. And then I started acting out at school because nobody told me what the rules were. And so I set a record for the school that had more demerits than any kid that ever had come to the academy in the first year. And each demerit represented one hour of your free time where either you marched or had to do exercises or whatever they put you through. And because I was such an unfiltered mouth, um, I got whipped with wire hangers, uh, broomsticks were broken over my back. The headmaster was gay and wanted to have an affair with me. And uh, he took me with a group camping and I saw him doing something with the boy and I zipped my cover of my sleeping bag over my head. And I just, after that, I couldn't put up with him. And he pulled me in his office and said, you know, I hear you're having some fun with the boy after everything I've done with you. I said, I don't know who told you that, but that's not true. I'm not having any, I, that's not my thing. And so he made me pull my pants on and he hit me with a paddle on my butt until he thought he was going to get me to confess that I was having an affair with one of the boys. And I would have bled to death before I said that because it wasn't true. Now, that left a really horrible taste in my mouth for the gay community for a really, really long time until my sister's friend who was gay took me to a club and I had a whole different experience of the gay people. It, they weren't gay, they were just people. And this gay guy sat next to me and asked me to dance. I said, I don't think so. And he laughed and he said, you're straight, aren't you? I said, straight as an arrow. And he sat there for about an hour with me and we just had the greatest conversation. And I kept thinking, this guy is gay. What does that matter? We're having this great conversation. He's treating me like a human being and what's wrong with it? And, and that flipped me around to understand that love is love and you don't judge it by their sexual preference. 
And it, it was a big eye opener for me. Well, and, and in the book, that's what you, you show a lot. You show different perspectives of things. You know, you went in with this perspective, but then this experience changed your perspective at things. And that's what I kind of liked about the book when I was reading your story, John, was the different perspectives of going into the gay bar, because that is in the book. And, you know, and that person asking you to dance and you're like, uh -uh, no, get out of here. Like, you know, uh, but then realizing that that person was person you know and i think that's what we have to do in today's society is everyone has their own flavor and their own blend don't don't knock it you know if you don't like it it's not your cup of tea doesn't mean you have to be rude and and close it off right you can just exactly. say you know what uh, there's many people out there that are doing that you, you know all the power to you but it's not for me you know and we keep coming back to it's not my cup of tea. It's, you know, it flows like a tea. So I want to get into your tea, John. So if I give you the words TEA, what three words would you give me this morning? Uncover, discover, and recover. You went there. I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> well, you know it's in the book, so it was an easy one. <laughs> And that's what I mean. Like when you read the book and when you do your research, you're like, ah, and it was right on the top of, I'm not lying guys. It's right there. And I knew he was going to go. I knew you were going to go there, John, because I had a big question mark because I wanted to know about those three words, why you use those three words. All right. So on my path to, to recovery, <clears throat> I had more questions than answers. I was really messed up in the head. And, I, and one day I was just like, my brain was about to explode and I just started breathing and I said, okay, let, let, let's think this through here. What is it that you're really upset about? Can you verbalize it or are you just letting these things and emotions run around rampant in your head and keep you confused and never identifying it so that you can maybe walk past it or get around it somehow? So I decided that I, I needed to uncover what was bothering me. Okay, so that was the first part of uncover. Then the second part of that was I said, all right, so let's assume that today, this is what's got me depressed. This is what I think happened. Did it in fact happen? Or was there an, another truth that maybe is a second perception, which is why I have those two voices in the book. It, it's one saying what the little boy went through with an honest feeling towards it. And then the adult looking back and saying, Yes, I understand that boy went through that, but it wasn't the truth of what he was feeling. His feelings were valid because that's how he felt and you can't deny that, but that wasn't what was really happening. So I had to discover whether or not my truth for that situation was real or is there another truth? Once I understood those two elements, I thought, all right, so now what do we do? Now what do we do to get past this? So that was the part of the recovery is to take necessary steps to getting past it. So you uncover, you discover, and you recover. And I use that tool every single day of my life because if I walk in a room and for some reason I start getting the jitters or something, I stop and say, well, what's going on? I say, oh, you don't know anyone here. Okay, so you've uncovered it. What's the truth? The truth is, is you have the potential of meeting somebody wonderful here instead of freaking out and saying everyone's an asshole or something. And once you start talking to somebody, you've gone down the path of recovery by taking a step, which is to talk to somebody. Now, usually if I get in that group, I'll try to find somebody I know or have met. I'll go over and start talking to them. And then I ease myself into this situation that had me off balance in the first place. And then I relax and, and I can enjoy the evening. I you know, I, I had all these questions all prepared and John is just like taking me down this different path that I'm just like, oh, I knew he was going to go there. And, and like, John, I'm, I'm like, the notes are here. And like, I have so many different things that I have prepared. And I'm like, he's getting it over this way. He's taking me to the left side instead of the right side. And I'm just like, Oh, okay. Because I have the word homosexual there because in the book, you really get into it. And, and we, we, we just talked about it, you know, the perception of meeting somebody, you just like, Ugh, you know, until you get to know that person and which you're uncover, discover, recover, you, you know, you take you through that process of, okay, uncover the situation in the bar, discover, and then recover. 
you know, when you actually get to know the different perspectives. And you just said something, the little boy and the grown man. And we started this conversation with you as a little boy to who you are now. You know what I mean? I, this flow of tea is just like, I'm just like, oh, oh he's taking me here. Okay, I got I got to go this way now. Like, you know, uh, I prepare myself, like, but I'm just like, oh, like, okay, let's go there. So, John, I want to get into, like, a little bit more of the abuse because I want to go deep into the abuse. Uh, in the book, you explain about a female. Uh, I want to get into that story. All right. Well, my sister had a bunch of her girlfriends over, and uh, this one girl kept winking at me. And, you know, I was really young. I, I didn't know what that meant. Um, this is even before I went to military school. So I'm, we're talking probably 10 or 11, something like that. And so my sister said, all right, let's go down to, I forget, the ice cream shop or something to, to get a soda. And they were all leaving. And as she was the last one out, she put her hand on my shoulder and said, um, I really like you. And I said, oh, okay, fine. And I closed the door and I started going up the stairs and there was a knock on the door and it was her. And she came in and closed the door and said, uh, I think I forgot something up in your sister's room or your room. I said, I don't think it's in my room. She goes, well, let's go look. Now, again, I had no concept of what was going on. And she took me up into the room, closed the door and put me on the bed and sat next to me. She goes, do you like me? I said, well, what's not to like? And she goes, do you think I'm pretty? Now I'm starting to get very uncomfortable because no skills with women. You know, it's like, oh boy, I, I don't know what's going on here. And she started on doing her blouse and then put, pushed me down on the bed and sat on me and took her blouse off and her bra and put my hands on her breast. And I said, you know, I don't want to do this. She goes, why, aren't you a man? And see, that's where a lot of people think that men can't be raped. Now, the difference obviously between a male and a female is a female is taking in a physical object into her body and violating her, where a man's taking something mentally into his head and getting really screwed up over it. Now, yes, we have a physical contact, but um, it's a lot different. It's not as invasive physically, but they're both very invasive emotionally. So there I am with her on top, these rather large breasts staring at my face, and she starts rubbing against my um, private parts. And I, you know, I something was growing, and I didn't understand what was happening. And she started undoing my belt, and I said, "Can we please stop, please, please?" And she just wouldn't. And then the doorbell rang, and it was my friend Michael. And thank God for him, because I don't know what would have happened, but I felt very violated and I felt like I had been raped and it set me down a really bad path for having any kind of healthy sexual relationship for a long time. And that's why I wanted to get into it, John. And I really want to thank you because you are a voice for many men out there that are listening. I have a lot of older men that listen to Tea Time. And, you know, there's a lot of the men that have been silent, you know, and you were violated and you, were, you know, and like you said, there was no penetration. There was no, you know, uh, and yes, I do go deep. So for all my viewers out there, uh, I want to get deep with John this morning because I feel that it's important that men's stories get heard as well. You know, we're, I'm a woman, but I have a son and I would want my son to have a voice as well. So, John, I want you to uh, share with the viewers and listeners out there about um, feeling violated. And did you turn to Mike, the guy that rang the doorbell, Michael, and tell him what had happened? Or did you stay silent for years? Like, how did, how did you deal with this? He was my best friend and still is since childhood. Um, and I said, we, used, we called each other Piggy. I don't know. You know, we had a whole history about that. But anyway... Uh, I started explaining what happened and I said, she wants me to get a rubber and come back and do, he goes, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to run and keep running and running and running. So we both started running like idiots, right? We didn't know what we were doing. And he goes, what are you going to do? I said, I, I think I'm going to try and forget that this ever happened. She goes, you're not going to tell your sister. I said, no, I can't. I cannot talk to my sister about this. I can't talk to my mother, certainly, because she'll tell me I'm full of baloney. And I had nowhere to turn. And in that time of life, there was really no outlets for mental health or helping kids get past things like that. So I now bury that into my psyche. And then after military school, I buried the homosexual part of life into my psyche. So I didn't have a male and I didn't have a female. So what was I, a eunuch? I, I, didn't, I didn't know who I was sexually or 
if I'm a male or if I'm a duck, I, I just didn't know. And it was a very painful experience to go through. Well, and as a man, right, you're always told, especially back in the day where, uh, you know, growing up, it was hush, hush, don't say anything, uh, you know, um, pull your and pull pull your big boy and boy pants up, you know, like, you know, get over it, you know. Yep. Big boys uh, don't cry. Big boys don't cry. You know, you're supposed to be a man. You know, you you need to be seen but not heard. That was the whole thing back then. So, John, by sharing your story today and on many other podcasts and other news outlets out there, have you, have you had men come to you and say thank you? I've had plenty of men and women, believe it or not, uh, write to me privately on all the platforms, thanking me for being honest about the book. Um, I'll share this with your audience because I think it's important. A, a reviewer got a hold of the book and reviewed it. And his wife sent me a, an email. She said, uh, we read your book over the weekend out loud. And then he went over to the phone and picked up the telephone and called his mother, who he hadn't spoken with for over 10 years. And because of your book, she is now back in his life. And that I just burst out crying. Uh, when I read that, I thought, wow, if that help somebody that to that degree I, I have a successful book here you know it's that's what it was all about for me i i wanted people to find ways to to regroup part of their life recover part of their lives uh, and and find the essential thing that is miss it's a myth about learn to forgive others for that you for what you think they did no when i stopped doing that i realized the only person i had to forgive was myself because everything in front of me was because of me and my actions and how I dealt with life. And if I was gonna change that, I needed to forgive myself for a lot of things. And it transformed a lot of um, my relationships, my mother and I, and uh, it was a really good uh, awareness moment. I wanna get into that, John. Because of being violated by a woman and because you felt abandoned by your mom at the age of 12, how is your relationship with women? Now it's fantastic. I can't get enough of them. I love every bit of them. Um, uh, fortunately, I have a wife of 32 years that's very secure. So when I start talking to women, she doesn't get crazy or jealous or anything because she knows I just enjoy talking to people. And anyone around me, I'll start talking to because I'm very uh, curious about the world. I'm curious about what people do. I'm interested in their lives. I'm not looking for anything from them. So it's just really good to explore that kind of thing. Uh, I trust women now where my first, after my first marriage, I didn't trust a, a single woman on the planet. I just, and then I started realizing again, I wasn't trusting myself because of the bad relationship I had. I thought, well, I, I don't know how to make a judgment of who's a good woman, who isn't, what's right for me, what isn't right for me. And you start mind games with your head and, Pretty soon, you just don't trust anybody. And I had to get seriously out of that. And it was not an easy path. And so I decided to date three women, be transparent with them, tell them I was having sexual relationships with them, and that um, I wasn't prepared to just like fall in love right away. And then Linda came into my life. And so that was a fourth. And over time, I realized she was my friend besides, you know, participant sexually. And one night she came over to spend the night and I put a piece of chocolate on her pillow and she hugged me as if I had given her a diamond. And at that moment I fell in love with her. I said, this woman appreciates the, the art of giving a gift, not what the gift is about. And to this day, 32 years later, whoever cooks or does something, we always say thank you. We've never taken our relationship um, as, as for granted. We very much tell each other how much we appreciate each other. We still hold hands. I mean, it, it's it's a wonderful marriage made in heaven. So do you remember the name of that chocolate? I don't, but I know it was from Switzerland because I had come back with a big box. Of it. <laughs> I, uh, I was really curious about that because I had heard you share this on another podcast and I was like, I wonder if he remembers the chocolate and if it's an every year anniversary, just a little piece of chocolate, you know? It was milk chocolate, I know that, but... Um, Geez, I should remember it because the, maybe that's a magic pill for other guys. <laughs> <laughs> right? For all the listeners out there, like, what kind of chocolate did he get that he got 32 years, right? Like nobody's getting those years anymore with marriage. But you you mentioned something, John, that's really important. You and Linda were friends. 
you became friends before you became lovers, you know, and I think that's deeply important in relationships. And I think that's where the longer relationships work. Like my grandma was married to my grandpa for 60 years. And she wow. said he was a, he was a hard head. He like, he was stubborn and, you know, he was a bull, but they had their, their hardships, but they worked things out, you know, and they were friends first before they were lovers. And I think that's where a lot of us are getting it wrong. We want the loving first before the friendship and never well, we, just we, we, we've lost sight of what um courtship's about everyone wants this fast food thing you know it's like wow uh, you know okay um this is our first date but how many kids do you want what kind of religion you know what, uh, uh, said, no 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 we're on a first date Let, let's let's talk about first date things like what color do you like <laughs> you know what's your feelings about this and and don't be afraid to court it's a really good thing now I'm going to tell you, you and your audience something that I found incredibly valuable for me is because we started out as friends, occasionally if we get into a big fight as man, woman, husband and wife, one of us will stop and say, hold on, I don't want my spouse right now. I need my friend. I need my friend to come out and talk to me because I'm lost in this conversation. It's a very uncomfortable conversation, one we have to have but I don't want to have it with my wife because it's too hot of a spot. I need my friend to talk to and get a perspective. And for some reason that really works for us because then we calm down uh, and, and we can talk civilly. Now, if we can't, one of us will also say, I'm getting really triggered here. I need some space away from this to think about it. How about if we do this in 24 hours and we both have agreed no matter how much we want to No, I want it now. Uh, we will <laughs> stop and say, okay. And usually within 24 hours, for me, I'll speak for myself, not the world out there. Um, it gave me enough time to process and see where I was a participant in and where I needed to make the corrections and, and or an apology or whatever I thought was necessary. And that's been a really valuable lesson for me. Well, it's like, I like that, that you can call your friend, you know? It's like that, uh, what was it? There was a game show that was on TV for the longest time. Yeah. Really. Dial a friend, uh, you How know. Long, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, right? And I was just like, I like that. But when you don't make that friendship first, who do you call, right? Wait, yeah. You got to call Michael or you got to call, you, you know, you got to call somebody else. And then somebody else is in this situation and it's only between the two yous, but now you got the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. You know, and I think that's where the, we have a lot of dysfunction in the world today is we're calling that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, you know, and then we have the whole group involved and everybody's giving us all different perspectives. And then the person that we're actually having the problem with doesn't get resolved because everybody else is in there. Right. You uh, said a mouthful because the only two people that will ever resolve a problem are the two people having the problem. Don't listen to your friends. Don't listen to them. Just you. They're going to be uncomfortable conversations. There's no doubt. That's just life. Yeah. If you don't learn to have them, you'll be divorced. I promise you. Yeah. I, I, I really, I'm really enjoying this conversation because there's a lot of keys that I'm learning to, you know, uh, and a couple of new doors that you have to open, you know, you got to get that locksmith in there and change the lock sometimes and try a new key and see if that works. So I want to thank you for that, John. Um, You're welcome. I want to get into now the movies and how you got into all of that because you were in military school, you had you came from the ghetto. How did you get to Hollywood? Well, that's a long journey, and I'll try to keep it very short. Um, I started out college as a chemistry major because I wanted to cure cancer because that's what my dad died of, and I was on a mission to do that. And after being in class for a while, my teacher said, "John, take a walk with me." I said, "Okay," and. Um, we're walking goes, uh, why are you in my class? I said, why are you asking? He said, well, you do three hour labs in 45 minutes and you get them right. You do tests and you get A's. You're really a good student at this, and but I wanna know why you're in chemistry. I lowered my head and I told him the story and he goes, I thought it was something like that. It's admirable, but John, you're not the guy with the pocket holders with the pens in it. It's just not your personality. I've already talked to the Dean of Admissions and you're no longer in my class. You got to go find yourself. I said, wait, you just told me I'm an A student and you're throwing me out of class. He goes, you're probably not ready to hear this, but you need to go find yourself because I see an artist in you, not a chemist. So I sat down on the lawn and I'm sitting there completely lost going, I don't know what just happened. 
And my African-American friend, Liz, comes over and says, what are you doing? And I told her the story. She goes, oh, I thought you were a great student. So finish the story. And she said, well, can you help me if you're free? Now, I'm thinking she wants me to help her move furniture or something, you know? And I said, yeah, of course, Liz. And she takes me into the theater. I said, what are we doing here? And she goes, I need somebody to just read lines. I said, I'm not an actor. She goes, you don't have to be an actor. Just read them naturally. And I said, oh, Liz, I'm going to choke you for this. And so I get on stage <laughs> and I start reading. And about an hour in, I looked at my watch. I said, uh, excuse me, Mr. Director, I've got to go because I have homework. And he goes, you can't leave a rehearsal. And I went, what? And I look at Liz and I go, and she had this big smile on her face. <laughs> And he goes, yeah, you're the lead in this. I said, no, I'm not the lead in this play. I don't know what I'm doing. They said, no, you're doing great. And then the whole cast came around me and said, no, you're doing really great. This is your first time on a stage. I said, and my last, if I can help it. But that didn't work out. And so I did the play. And then a year later, I wrote my first play uh, that was performed for parent-teacher conference. And then I went off to um, Colorado and I got involved in a program called the University Without Walls which were for kids that knew what they wanted to do. So, and then my teacher got me involved in the local theater down there. So I didn't have to go to class anymore. And then I became part of the Denver Lyric Opera where I played interludes and uh, preludes on my sitar and all sorts of fun stuff. And um, then I came out to California to do my master's degree in directing. And during my thesis, I was in a, a cafe having dinner and I looked over and there was a guy dressed in pure white and everyone's laughing and pointing at him. And he caught my eye, I caught his, and I, I kind of nodded in, in terms of saying hi. And I went back to work and he came and sat next to me and asked me what I was doing. So I told him, you know, I was doing my master's and I had to perform this play. I had to direct it and I think, he said, hey, can I come watch it? I said, yeah, sure, why not? Now, back then I was not into, hi, what's your name? What do you do for a living? How can you help me? It, it was, again, I was just being a friend to a friend, a friend. Yeah. About six, seven months later, I said, hey, by the way, John, what do you do for a living? He goes, oh, I'm an art director in the film business. I went, no kidding, really? He says, why, are you interested? I said, well, yeah, I, theater I love, but it's, it's not where I want to be. I want to be in film because I took a short film class with a, a world-famous documentarian and fell in love with it. He goes, well, let me see what I can do. I'll see if I can get you on a set one day. I said, okay. Three o'clock in the morning, he calls me. He says, get dressed and come and pick you up. So he put me on the set and he said, you stand here. If anyone bothers you, tell them you're my guest and they'll leave you alone. This old crumpy guy comes walking over to me and goes, hey, what are you doing on a set here? And I think, oh, good. I'm going to get thrown off my first set. He goes, you come with me. I said, here we go. I didn't even do anything. I didn't look at anyone. You didn't, <laughs> didn't even off. touch anything yet. <laughs> I didn't even breathe and I'm getting thrown off. So he puts me in a van and he says, here, take this and wrap it with, with the electrical tape. So I'm doing that. I said, what is this stuff? He goes, primer cord. I said, what's that? And he goes, an explosive. And I threw it up in the air and jumped out of the van. I said, are you out of your mind? I don't know what I'm doing. He goes, no, no, no. And he took a match. And he's playing with the match. And he goes, no, this won't go off unless you have a dynamite cap that makes it triggered. And, you know, this stuff could blow steel girders apart. That's what they do in World War II to break bridges apart is wrap prime accord. And then so I'm sitting on this box wrapping. I said, what's in the box? He goes, oh, that's gunpowder. Again, I threw the stuff and jumped out of the van. I said, are you out of your mind? So it turns out this guy was the um, stuntman who swung from the bell tower of Hunchback in Notre Dame. That's how entrenched this guy was. And he looked like me. So he took me under his wing and taught me about special effects. And then I got into the prop department and I became a uh, dialogue director because I had a mouth on a set and said actors didn't understand their dialogue. And the director was sitting next to me and goes, what's your name? I said, John Callis, why? He stands up and goes, what's this fool doing? And the guy next to me went, that's the director. Oh crap! I want to slide <laughs> under the table. But he liked my tenacity, so he made me the dialogue director. And then uh, Miss Liz, everything dropped out. I couldn't get a job to save my life, and so I took a, a counselor job at an employment agency. I built a brick wall on Sunset. I uh, became a waiter, and nothing was working until this guy walked in and who I had known, a production manager. He said, "What are you doing, being a waiter?" I said, "I can't get a job." And he offered me a prop job. And um, and after that, it started taking off again. And I just, I had to come up with creative ways to keep finding work, which I did. And, and that's a whole story into itself. But um, I, I just decided that my life was like a blank piece of paper. I took a blank piece of paper and I said, how do you want your life to look? Not how it is now, not airy fairy stuff. What is it that you want 
your life to look like. And that's where it started really honing in on what I wanted to do in the entertainment business. Well, and you, and there's a statement. I don't know where I found the statement, if I found it on a website or if I found it in the book, but you said wine and roses to climb the ladder. It wasn't wine and roses. Uh, you know, and a lot of people think that it is wine and roses, you know, working in the, in the field that you're working in, John. But like you're, like you're sharing, you know, you had to climb that ladder to get to the top, uh, you know, and sometimes you fall off the ladder and you got to climb back up that ladder. Uh, I really want to put that out there to the viewers and listeners out there, you know, because they, they just see Hollywood and, oh, it's all fancy dance. But there's a lot of hidden work that goes behind the scenes that we don't see. And we don't hear about. So, John, could you share one of your biggest experiences? Um, you know, like you just shared about the first day on set. But over the years, working with all the different people that you've worked with, what's one story that sticks out to you the most? I think it was um, when I was introduced to all the senior members in the president of TriStar Sony Pictures because uh, the agency I was working for uh, brought me in because I was their production company and co-director and producer and all that nonsense. And um, they unveiled a painting of the TriStar logo. That's, you know, Pegasus with the big wings and everything. And the head uh, in, in that organization said, all right, who's the jerk that's going to uh, do this production? Now, the guy that brought me in kicks me under the table because he knows I, I get triggered when people do that kind of crap to me. And I rose and said, uh, that jerk would be me, sir. And so he looks at me and goes, all right, wise guy. You see this painting? I said, yes, sir, I do. He says, I don't want anything fake in this painting. I want everything in this painting to be real. I don't want no fakeness, nothing, nothing, nothing. And he's going on and on and on and on. And Anthony's kicking me under the table. He's trying to calm me down. He goes, so how are you going to do it? And everyone in the room's looking at me. I said, well, I guess I better find a flying horse because you don't want anything fake. And the whole room cracks up laughing. And this guy looks, he goes, very funny, smart ass. Um, Okay, other than the flying horse, how are you going to do it? I said, sir, I could sit here and come up with a number of scenarios all to, to please your question. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you that what you've just presented is very complicated. It's going to take some thinking. I don't have an answer for you, but I will. And just give me some time. I'll put a budget together. I'll hand it to Anthony, and he can talk to you about it. And he looks and goes, I like your answer. I like you aren't going to try and BS me. I said, I can't, I can't because I don't know what the BS about. And so I had to, to do an enormous amount of research about how to get a horse to run straight line, how to get the hooves, uh, special effects. We did over a hundred film composited elements in that. Uh, nothing was artificial except the wings on the horse, which were the opening of CGI in entertainment. And it was really a complicated shoot. And then I get a call from Anthony. He says, come down the editing room. We're having troubles. So I ran down there and I said, what's the problem? He says, look at this. And I'm looking at it. And he goes, we've had experts in, uh, you know, birds and everything. And, and they say the wings are moving exactly like a bird. It's, it's geometrically all perfect, but it doesn't look right. And we can't figure it out. And I'm smiling. He goes, okay, what's up? I said, I know exactly what the problem is. He said, what's the problem? I said, birds go like this, right? He says, yeah. I said, that's what you got with the horse, right? He goes, yeah. If I said to everyone in the room, how does a bird fly? What is everyone going to do? They go like this. I said, that's why it's not looking right. The mind doesn't see this in a bird. They see this. So if you change the wing position from this to this, it's going to make sense. Oh, wow. And they all looked at me and they said, nah. I said, yes, that's my answer. Two days later, I got a call from Anthony. He says, you're a genius. It's working. It's great. I love it. So then we presented it to TriStar and the guy gets up because everything in this uh, film was exactly what we wanted. Okay. But we don't like it. <laughs> so uh, uh, what, what is it you don't like? <laughs> well, we don't, we want to see some clouds separating by the, the hoofs. How are we going to do that? And Anthony looks at me and said, well, I'd have to build a box, probably 100 by 60, line it with the black velvet, put fog in it and separate it, and then we can mat it over. And this is all in film, not digital. This was a very complex process. And so they gave me the money to do it. I did it. We inserted it. And they, they were like over the moon. And obviously, it's a, it's a world-renowned icon. So that was um, 
that's what started setting me up where people would call me and they'd say, if you can't figure something out, call Callus. He'll figure it out. It's not going to be cheap, but he'll get it done. And that sort of gave me a little bit of a different uh, flavor than most of the other people out there. And, and John, it's really important because you just said they like, took a hundred sets, you know, where people see this two second or five second intro and they're thinking, ah, that didn't take long. That there's no work to that. Like, you know, but it's all of the work. And, and like you said, you went in there like, no, we don't like it. <laughs> you know, then you're like, oh, like, come on, where are we going with this again? Like, you know, and I think that's what I liked about the book was when the rain stops is that you were really transparent and you're like, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat my life and my story for people that are going to read it. You know, it might not be for everyone, but this is the way it happened. And that's how you kind of go into your work field as well Is you know what, I'm not going to come in and sugarcoat shit for you. I'm going to tell you there's no BS. I can't do it. What you're asking is not capable of being done, you know, but let me, figure it out and let me get to that. And I think that's where the journey of your story, where the rain stops, you really make people stop for a minute and think, whoa, we really got to figure this out. You know, we got to find that solution. And I think I love the title of your story too, because it makes you stop. It makes you listen. It makes you hear the story, read the story and understand the story. We're not stopping enough in life, you know? We're yeah. just go, 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 go. We're going for that fast food, right? We're not doing the courtship. Yeah. When we're reading a book, we're just reading a book. We're not we're not understanding the book. We're not getting into the book. So when people ask me to read their story and they send me their books, I'm like, okay, it's going to take me a while. It might take me a week to read your book. I'm not going to read it in 24 hours because if I read it in 24 hours, I'm just reading. Hmm. I need the process, right? And that's what you do with your work, John, is you take it and you process it and you say, like, let me figure this out. Like, you know, and that's why people come to you, John, is because you actually don't give them horse shit. You give them the real shit, you know, like you you're like, it's going to take me time. Let me figure it out. But you're going to get an end result that you're going to like. Yeah. Yeah. I won't take work unless I have the right amount of money to do it properly. Now, that's not to say I haven't done stuff really cheap, but there was a way to do it right, even cheap. Right. So John, what final message do you have for the listeners out there this morning? Life's not easy. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It's not easy, but it can be a hell of a lot of fun. Surround yourself with people you trust, <clears throat> love, and can be friends and do things with. Um, but always remember how you're participating and be honest with yourself and them. Then they can't come back and hurt you. You can't be hurt because what you said is true. And if you do find yourself in that position, find a different friend. But I think the most important thing is in the morning when you're brushing your teeth, say good morning to yourself. Tell yourself you love yourself. And if you're having a really bad day, see if it's a depressing day or if it's just a lousy day. Now, depression is something that everybody in this country will experience once in their life at least. And until you experience it, you don't understand the real darkness to it. So the, the, the difference is, is in the second day you wake up, if you're still depressed, you're thinking, OK, something's really buggy. I got to try to figure it out. If there's a third or fourth day and you're still there, I highly recommend going to see a therapist and saying, look, I'm four days into this depression. I can't figure it out. As opposed to last week, I woke up, I felt crappy, but by the end of the day it was fine. So it was just a crappy day and everyone has them. So you, you define those two differences. But I think it's important to forgive yourself, to love yourself, and to do things for yourself. I sometimes just take myself to the movies, you know, or I take myself for a walk. I go for bicycle rides all the time, and I really enjoy it because my head's clear. I get to think about all sorts of weird stuff, and <clears throat> it, it just it works for me. So find the things that work for you. Make a list of what you want your life to look like. Find out where you are on that list and do it one step at a time. Uh, in other words, if you come into the film business the first day and you're carrying coolers, don't think the next day you should be directing because that's a long haul. But go back to what the military always taught. Keep your ears and eyes open and your mouth shut. And then that way you're going to learn, listen, look, apply it. And then the next job, you try to get up the scale a little bit at a time. Don't overstep yourself and just remember your position and always do your job. 
and be there early and leave late and you'll get noticed. No, thank you so much, John. And I really want to thank you for coming and sitting and having tea with me. I had a pleasure this morning, uh, before, during, and after. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed today's conversation. And I want to thank you for bringing a voice to men as well. Uh, you know, get your stories out there, men. You have a voice to get that out there. I will be back at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with the second tea time. And we'll be talking about serving inner peace. And then we're going to be wrapping it up with a tattoo murder uh, with Bob Burrell. So there's going to be a lot of deep, deep discussion today on tea time. So until then, I will see everybody at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the last tea time of this week. Again, thank everybody, the viewers and listeners out there. Share this tea time. We want to make a difference by sharing different cups of teas. And you're going to uncover, discover, and recover. That's the tea that John served this morning with all of you guys out there. So until then, I'll see you this afternoon for the second tea time.